Hello, everybody. We're here today with Dr. Robert Charette, and we are going to talk about managing IT risk for fun and profit. Hello, Dr. Charette. Thanks for joining us today. I want to tell everybody a little bit about our guest today. Uh, Dr. Robert Charette is an internationally acknowledged authority and pioneer in risk ecology management, systems engineering, and the management of very large-scale software-intensive systems. He's also an award-winning contributing editor to IEEE Spectrum Magazine. Uh, he's the editor of the Spectrum's very popular Risk Factor blog, which I read all the time. Some of the most interesting stuff out there. You should check it out. Uh, Bob's also the co-editor of the Aftershock column for IEEE Computer Magazine. He's written scores of articles on the management of business and technical risk, and he's the author of several classic books about risk. Uh, there are many people in the industry who consider Bob to be the grandfather of IT risk. I know he's a mentor to many people in the industry, including myself. He's uh, his, his knowledge is both broad and deep, and we're very lucky to have him here today. Bob, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for, uh, for having me today. Hope it's a great conversation. <laughs> yes, indeed. It always is with you. So let's start with a really simple question. Uh, what do you mean? You're the first person that ever actually used this term. Uh, many years ago, I mean, I don't want to say how long, uh, risk ecology, uh, very interesting use of that term. What do you mean when you talk about in your work, uh, I, technology risk ecology? Well, what I, what I mean is, is that when we take a look at information technology systems or information and communication systems, what we need to worry about and need to think about are the risks that they pose, not just from a technical standpoint, which has been the traditional aspect of risk management and computing, things like cybersecurity or project failures, why do, why do projects fail, those types of things, and think more broadly in terms of how IT systems actually interact with not only other IT systems, but with human systems. So when we talk about risk ecology, what we're really worried about are all the interconnections of the risks that occur from a technical standpoint, a organizational standpoint, a social standpoint, a political standpoint, a financial standpoint, because all these things are interconnected. And they become even more interconnected as computing itself becomes more interconnected and society as a whole becomes very dependent on these systems. So we need to worry about the risks as well as the rewards and try to understand how, like in an ec ecological standpoint of how, if I change one risk, how do they uh, affect other risks and other opportunities? So it's it's a very you know, broad view of looking at risk so that we can't just view risk in a technological standpoint, which has been traditionally what we've done. So, you know, as we make this move towards, I, I would say an in, in, uh, total interconnectedness is kind of, for lack of a better term, I mean, for mo those of us in the audience who are following, all of these uh, trends in terms of what they call digital transformation, the fourth industrial revolution. We've got all of these new uh, technologies out there, whether it's uh, the internet of things, they refer now to the internet of bodies. There's this convergence of the biological world with the non-biological world. We've got advances in you know, deep learning, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality. Everything seems to be kind of uh, moving exponentially and converging on each other. Uh, some people have called it the, uh, a world of total interconnectedness. Um, how, how does that uh, really increase this, this risk problem, um, uh, especially from this ecological perspective? There's always, obviously, it's not just the fact that you've got systems of systems that are interconnected in ways that nobody understands, but you've got all these political and economic components that are, that are tied into it as well. How do you see things? Do you see this as being dangerous or do you, are you op opportunistic about it? going forward over the next five to 10 years? Well, part of me, uh, as, I, as, as I've told you in the past, I'm a uh, cynical optimist. Uh, there's, as we interconnect more and more systems, obviously the potential for failure and the consequences of failure have increased just because the number of systems that are interconnected, even if they were all 99% reliable, you, you get enough in there, you're gonna have a, have a collapse. And so one of the things that, that also makes me worried or concerned is that we don't build systems that are very reliable. Uh, there's, there are, we have a whole spectrum, but if we take a look, the, the failure rates in computing in terms of developing systems is still hovering about 35 to 40%, depending on, on who you're looking at. 
the amount of money that is wasted annually has been computed to be about 2.8 to $3 trillion a year on poor software quality. And so if you, if you take a look at how systems are developed, uh, how they're maintained or how, <laughs> how they're not maintained, and you keep adding to this, these number of systems, we're talking about you know, billions of, of devices in an uh, Internet of Things universe, uh, connecting to systems that may be 60 years old, <laughs> um, it, it does give one pause to think about how this is all going to work and how we're going to keep from having Armageddon, in a sense, from a technological standpoint. Uh, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, why we haven't gotten there yet, uh, although we've seen indications every now and then of, of what might happen when we have some of these major outages. But, you know, part of me also says that, you know, hopefully we're going to learn. We, we build systems better today than we did 40 years ago when I, or 45 years ago, plus when I got into the business. And so we know more. The, the real question, I think, Michael, is are we going to use what we know and actually be disciplined in how we create these systems? And as, especially as we build these systems that are more and more powerful, if we have autonomous systems and we have a, autonomous, you know, the killer robots, um, you know, are those good things? You know, there's <laughs> that, that's a discussion. Or even if we have autonomous vehicles and they crash, well, one argument you can say, well, if they crash less than, than human drivers, that's a, that's a benefit. But even in, in small numbers of crashes, who's responsible? Who, who are we going to hold responsible for an autonomous vehicle crash? Is it, you know, the, the driver who should have hopped in uh, at the last moment? Is it the software designer? Is it the supplier of the software? Is it, you know, the OEM who, who you bought the, the vehicle from? You know, all these questions, there, there's a lot of these questions that we haven't resolved as we move more toward intelligent systems. So that's the next big leap. And those intelligence systems, especially if we're looking at them as being autonomous and, and where we don't have control and where we don't understand how they're making decisions, uh, you know, that that is worrisome, uh, you know, without a doubt. There are two two things that you mentioned that um, that are that those of us who are in the traditional kind of IT industry are well familiar with, which is that there's a 35 to 40 percent failure rate with with software projects. I mean, we all know this, that projects are notoriously go over budget over schedule or they fail outright. And you also mentioned that there are systems. I mean, most of the country is running on on computer systems that are 50 or 60 years old. It's something that most people who are not in the field don't understand. It's uh, all of these these these, you know, billions of lines of code of, of, of legacy systems. This is something that is curiously left out of all the utopian uh, the t utopianism that we hear about AI and new technologies and everything, which is the fact that why would we expect um, why would we expect the discipline of of IT and of software to somehow magically become uh, dial tone perfect uh, when we've been struggling with these issues for for forty for for fifty or sixty years? And how are we going to address? all of these legacy systems, which have to interact with this modern world that we're building. Uh, nobody talks about this. Uh, is there, you know, what are your, what are your particular thoughts about that? Well, you know, it, uh, I wrote a story for Spectrum last year, or the year before, I can't remember now, <laughs> uh, that, that looked at, at IT legacy systems. And, and we talk about it being in terms of living in the shadows, right? And, and technology and maintenance of technology systems has always lived in the shadow, in the shadow world. IT systems are, are interesting in that the reason we have legacy systems is kind of paradoxical. We have legacy systems because they work and they work really well. And so you're kind of loath to get rid of them. But at the same time, they also pose increasing dangers. You know, they, they're, they're systems that when they do fail, because they have been in operation for so long, have massive consequences. And so what, what we have is this, this really kind of weird situation where the legacy systems are here and um, we depend on them, but at the same time, we don't pay a lot of attention to them either. You know, one of the, the, the things that has uh, is, is been, again, well known in the field is that legacy systems get starved. Okay, if they work, you don't fool with them. And if you try to change them, it's actually fairly dangerous. 
uh, you know, if doing minor updates on a system that really may not have been well documented, well, you know, structured uh, using modern approaches, or they may be based on languages that, you know, literally only hundreds of people even know anymore. Uh, you know, th these cause, you know, <laughs> You know, sleepless nights for a lot of people. And one of the interesting things you you asked me in your question was, in if we go forward, who is to say that we're not going to do the same things with these autonomous systems, right? That we're once we get them out there, are we going to keep them updated? Are we going to keep them, you know, in in train? Because right now, eighty percent or more of all IT spend globally is on maintaining systems, and that maintenance is not actually modernizing, it was just keeping the lights going on. Okay, so as we, again, we keep building on top of this, this base. And when we do try to modernize, modernizations often fail. They're, they're often have higher failure rates than the original developments, because we're trying to do more and we're also trying to integrate them with more systems. So what we have is, is kind of this, this house of cards that you know, if we're not careful, if we don't really think through about what we have in terms of IT and our legacy base and how they're interacting with newer systems, uh, again, it, it, we haven't had, you know, it, it, it sounds like chicken little in one sense in that, you know, the sky is falling, you know, it could happen any time and it hasn't happened, but it's that classic case that everything is fine until the day it isn't. And so it's, it's that type of, of problem that, that we have that a dependency is going to be increasingly risky. It's, and we need to be able to figure out how we're going to mitigate this risk. Let's, uh, let's take a step. Let's take it up a level uh, from, from the, the, the particular to, to a little bit to the more general. Uh, help us understand, just on a kind of, not in an academic sense, but like, what would you say would be the root causes of risk to help our audience better understand if you want to break this down uh, as we go into this new world? What are the fundamental root causes of risk in your experience? Well, I think that the number one uh, that, that's always top on my list is incorrect assumptions. Uh, you know, if people, and, and this is tied closely to kind of the bias of, of being optimistic, you know, if when I do risk assessments and when I've done risk assessments, or if you just go online and you read risk assessments or project reports of project failures, you'll find in almost every single case, people making assumptions about the system, about the, the capability of the people, the capability of the technology, the ability to actually build systems in the, in the time that, that they specify or with the quality or at the cost. Uh, you know, I've always said it's really easy to make a, a system fail. I just don't give you enough time or enough money. You know, it's that that's not hard be, because what happens, it's really difficult to dig through and and actually understand what how much effort really is encompassed in building IT systems. We're all very optimistic about, uh, you know, using, you know, we know that, you know, in the field, we know that cost estimating tools are only within about 75%, 25% of the time, you know, which says that they're off a lot. And so, you know, our cost estimating tools aren't very good. How we um, structure systems enc encourages over-optimism. There's a lot of cognitive biases that, that come into play. So, you know, we can talk about root causes as really being in, in one sense, you know, maybe the, the second big one is that computing is too, too easy. <laughs> Right. We, we can build systems, we can build software, we can make code, but making it work and making it reliable and and understanding all the implications that, that come with it uh, is, is very hard work. There, there's also uh, another aspect, and this comes more, again, part of the ecological aspect of, of programs or organizations, is that when you're when you have a system and it's, you know, as you know, it takes a, a lot of effort and a lot of time to build these systems. And especially if you're now late or you're over budget, you know, the, the pressure is to get it out there to, to stop the financial bleeding. So one of the things that happens is testing is, is traditionally cut. And so systems are put out operationally before they're ready. And then these things have massive problems and it takes you a tremendous amount of time and effort to fix them afterwards. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of root causes, but I think that the, the 
the number one that I would I would put my my finger on is this lack of really checking your assumptions, really understanding all the things that uh, need that you that you think are going to happen versus are they really going to happen? Have you have you really you know it's what you know versus what you what you should know, and that gap. How do you close that gap? And, and this has been consistently true for the past. 40 years? Has anything yeah, changed? I don't think, in, I don't think has that, anything that changed? hasn't changed. I think, again, if you take a look at the failures in, in AI systems and those failure rates, again, depending on the literature, you know, have been claimed as high as 85 percent, uh, which is an unusual for a new technology or data analytics, which, again, you know, some some folks say is, is as high as 80, 85 percent, is that, again, we don't go through and take a look at the assumptions. You, you take a look at why AI systems fail, and there's certain assumptions that you make about what that system can do or what you need to make it accomplish a task. For instance, you take a look at IBM Watson. You know, when Watson came out and won on, on uh, Jeopardy, right? Um, and, you know, everybody claimed that, well, you know, the next thing is, is that it's going to solve all medical diagnos diagnostic problems. Right. We just feed it all in. It's be out there. No problem, because, you know, if we can if we can you know, solve the chess problem, if we can win on Jeopardy, you know, we can you know, solve all these problems. Well, uh, Watson isn't doing all that great right now. Um, and so, again, if you go back, there's a lot of assumptions of what you think you can do with AI until you actually try it. And then you find out that eh, it doesn't really work the way you think it is, because Again, you're optimistic, or another way of looking at it is maybe you're arrogant. Okay, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of uh, arrogance in our field. There has been, and, and there will always be. I think you you you've piqued my interest. You said Watson isn't doing so well right now. Could you be more specific? Well, again, the the, the element of of Watson, you know, the the especially in the medical field, uh, you know, a lot of the the contracts that were signed with IBM and with Watson have kind of let have been let to, to, to go um, the furrow because they, it really hasn't proven to be as useful as they had first anticipated. Uh, medical diagnostics is extremely hard. Part of the problem, again, is let's just take a look in data analytics. If you go into the, the field of electronic health records where you, where you can gather all this information, all this diagnostic information from everyone you know, in, in a, a usable form. What people forget is that a lot of that information is corrupted, is wrong. You know, I would, I would urge everyone to take a look at if they have an electronic medical record or a health record someplace to go and check it out because you may find that 10 to 20% of the information that is, is in your medical record is completely wrong. It's pretty hard to do diagnostics if lots of, of data is incorrect or there's data that's missing. And so what happens is that you find out that, you know, it's, it's the old computing problem of garbage in, garbage out. So unless you have clean data, valid data, um, and, and valid information to be able to really do all your learning algorithms, the things don't work quite as well as you, as you think they're going to. What exactly, uh, what would you say of all the, the new technologies that we're reading about, that are, some are pie in the sky, some are under development. I know that you have some thoughts about, you know, we've talked a little bit about quantum computing. You don't seem to be too, you don't sort of put too much confidence in that as basically an emergent technology. I'd, be, I'd like to know why uh, and, and what you feel the implications of that would be. But how, how is uh, uh, the move towards IoT and smart cities and autonomous vehicles, how does that change the risk equation in, in the future, in your opinion? Well, I think what, what you see in IoT and, uh, smart vehicles and, and smart cities is that computing has shifted from being kind of islands to interconnected islands to fused islands. It's almost like, like you know, the geological um, where, where when, when the continents separated, we, you know, we're, we're now moving in the opposite way. You know, the continents are all more moving back together again. And what happens now is is that computing is much more tied to what we call cyber physical systems, right? Where where there's a control of this of a physical system through cyber, 
And we're not talking about it in like a, a manufacturing plant or in a, a power plant or something like that. And we're now talking about it being computing being embedded in every device that that we op, we we interact with. You know, think of Alexa. Okay, things that we're now part of. Now Alexa goes in your car, and Alexa, you know, you 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 talk to a computer, which then helps drive a car, and that car might you know be self-driving and and decide to go on Beth Pass, you know, based on information that it's gathered from the from the environment. So now we have the environment and our computing systems all interacting. So we have you know third, fourth, fifth parties all interacting together. Um, to make decisions. And so that fundamentally changes how computing now operates. Because again, that information, we're, we're very dependent on the quality of that information that's coming and the latency of that information that's, that's coming from all these other maybe millions of sensors. You know, the idea in, in self-driving uh, vehicles, you know, in, in the next 10, 20 years is that they all communicate with one another. They give you weather data. They give you traffic data. They give you road conditions. They give you, you know, obstacles. They, they, you know, you, you want to order a pizza, you know, they can figure out exactly when you can pick up your pizza, <laughs> you know, in the car. You know, it's, I'm being a little facetious, but it's, it's now, you are now part of a larger ecosystem that is constantly in communication, constantly, um, uh, censoring you you're censoring it it's censoring you and so now you you in one sense you can't escape you know the environment because that environment now is totally wired uh, I, I don't know anybody actually who's at your level who uh is um not concerned about this move towards total interconnectedness there are a lot of obviously security issues cyber risks and whatnot that come from especially when you you know you get into the, the level of uh, of, biolog of of the biological world, you know, where they're now looking at, um, you know, both the the kind of convergence of the biological non biological world, the fact that you know, what if people can hack into your your you know to your body, like because everything is interconnected. Once people get wired in, actually get their biology wired into things, how are we supposed to deal with uh, these these hacking risks and cyber risks in a world that is that interconnected? It just seems like such a recipe for disaster. And like I said, I don't know anybody who's at your level who is. Um, who is optimistic. And most of those people would say, I would say, would say no to Alexa. They would say no to Nest. They would say no to wiring their house. Uh, and uh, so how, how are we supposed to kind of manage this going forward? It seems like an, an, an inexorable march towards interconnectedness. Well, I think there is. <laughs> and I'm not sure that you can totally manage these risks. You know, that one of the problems that you, that you have is, is the, the problem of the commons when you talk about IoT is that you have lots and lots of different suppliers who are providing you with IoT devices with different levels of security. And one of the issues you know, that I, I wrote about a number of years ago is what happens when those suppliers go out of business. And one of the, there's a int very interesting story that, that's hit the news. And in fact, it was, it was uh, part of Spectrum uh, News um, reporting this past week about people who had bionic eyes, you know, the, the uh, implants. And um, that company is going out of business. And if that software doesn't work, those people go blind. Okay, now there's hope that another company is gonna buy, you know, the original company and keep it going. But what happens if, again, you have implants and the software company goes out of business or the hardware company goes out of business? How do, how do we deal with that? You know, is the government supposed to come in and force people who've had, you know, force the companies who have implanted all these devices to stay in business? You know, that's not going to happen. So, you know, it's not just hacking. It's just, it, again, it's the issue of legacy, the issue of, you know, longevity, you know, in, in self uh, or in, in electric vehicles, you know, one of the things that car makers are, are trying to do is ensure that you have a battery that lasts 10 years. And if that battery happens, if the technology replaces it, that they'll come in and replace it with the newest technology. Because this, this idea that once we get in interconnected systems, you know, we're gonna have, you know, even worse than we have now, we're gonna have systems that are, that are new, old, some are really well secured, a lot of them have no security. And we're gonna be in a world that that risk ecology is going to be very, very complex. 
And we need ways to actually understand it, the ways to be able to understand where that where those risks are and how to manage it. At the same time, you know, these systems also provide tremendous benefit. And so there's there is this balance between risk and reward in terms of, OK, should should there be guardrails put up on some of this technology until we actually understand the risk or do we put it out there and then figure it out afterwards? Um, I'm. I'm of two minds, you know, you don't want to totally keep technologies in that are beneficial, but at the same time, I think that, that we don't understand the downsides until we put them out there and then we see them. Okay. It, it, we can talk about, you know, the internet and, and back in, you know, 1996 about the, you know, how, how it was going to free everyone. It was going to make everybody equal and it was going to make everybody you know, uh, give freedom to everyone. And, uh, you know, no, there was, you know, everyone's going to have a voice. Well, you know, we have that, but I'm not quite sure that was quite the vision in 1996 that that was being uh, articulated. Well, I mean, we were talking before the uh, session started about what I, my, my hypothesis that a lot of the uh, turmoil that we're seeing in the larger ecology, you know, the, both the political and the, and the economic spheres right now was because of specifically because of the internet, because of web 2.0, the, the decentralization of information that was a result of, of, um, of web 2.0. Now they talk about web 3.0, which uh, I'm wondering if you have any particular thoughts about that, the underlying technology, how that affects the overall risk ecology, and um, just any thoughts about that in general. I just think again, it's it's the it's the march toward again fusion, right? This this idea that everything is interconnected with with everything else. Now, the, the issue that that you have is that if you have this, if you have a a good architecture and a good design, then you and from the beginning, then and you understand that you have these potential risks, you can you know minimize the impacts. But we have found that over time, you know, there isn't anyone <laughs> that really has the power to create that architecture and to enforce it, right? These things, just like what's happened with the internet, it grows, it, it, it becomes organic. It, it's not something that anybody really controls. Uh, and so what happens, and, and again, what we've seen now in the last 10, 15 years is how governments have been able to move and shut the internet down in their countries, right? And, and do censorship. You know, we don't need to mention countries, but you know, there's a number of countries who, who, who actively censor what, what is said and have changed laws so that if you, if you say certain things on the internet or through Twitter or, or social media, that you can be arrested, okay? Where, you know, 20 years ago, before the net really took off, that wasn't, those things didn't exist because those things just didn't happen. Right, not in not in the in in the uh, the scale that that that's occurred. And I think that's one of the things is is that we're now at scales that it's very hard for any not only any person but any group of people to fully understand all the things that have to happen and, and are going to happen to either make something successful or understand all the different uses. You know, um, it, it there's a a historian, um, I'm trying to remember his name off, off the top of my head. Um, yeah, it, it's Melvin um, Krasberg. He said that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. <laughs> and so, you know, it, we use technologies in ways that, that are way beyond what the, what the original designers thought they were going to be used for. And um, a lot of times, they're used in ways that are not particularly beneficial. And so I'm not sure that, that I've answered your question about 3.0. I just think it's going to be more of the same, but on steroids. Well, maybe I should rephrase the question. I mean, uh, what are your thoughts about, do you have any thoughts about the blockchain and, and the risks of, the, of blockchain? I know that that's a big question because there's private blockchains and Companies are creating their own blockchains, but in general, as a tool, as a technology, what are your concerns about it? Well, I think again, the, the issue of blockchain. I'm 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 not a big blockchain fan. Um, I'm not sure that that there's tremendous 
you know, there, there's lots of claims of benefits for blockchain, but I, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of how much of these things are actually going to be very useful in the future that, that you couldn't do other ways that are, that are faster, cheaper, and, and as good. Um, I think that the, the issue with, with blockchain is that it, again, now gives another set of, of control. Remember, when you, when you do a blockchain, you have certain rules that are, that are being imposed and how information is captured and how it's passed and how it's vetted. And so if we put more and more things into blockchain and we, we now, whoever controls the vetting controls the blockchain and controls what information is in and what information is out. And so if you, if you are, you know, it's, it's like anybody, if you control the standard, you control the, the technology. And so I worry about, are these, are these vetting procedures, are the things that you can capture and what you can't capture in blockchains are those actually transparent? Can everybody see what those rules are and understand how information is being captured, how it's being decimated, what's being decimated? Um, again, it's, it, we're, we're not, the issue that we have, I think, again, in, in all of this technology that we have, no matter how, you know, I'm, I read about this every day. This is part of my, my everyday job is, is to read you know, dozens of newspapers and journals every day trying to keep up on this, is that it's really hard to understand what's going on. There is so much going on in so many different areas that, again, I can't say for certain that this is particularly good or this particularly bad at any one particular point in time, because there's something else that's probably hiding in the background that's just sitting out there being developed, and we don't know what's going on. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it is a very diff. It's it's a much different field than when I first got in. When I first got in, um, after I uh, as an undergrad, uh, I, I went to work for the Navy Department at the Naval Underwater System Center, as it was called back then. And I probably knew most of the computing people in the Navy in the Navy research laboratories. Uh, you you couldn't do that now. There's a you know the the growth is uh, of people in the field is has been tremendous. And so even in, in my field of risk management, you know, I don't know all the people who are in it like I used to. It, it's just because it's exploded. And so, again, all these technologies, I think the thing, Michael, that, that people need to understand is that it takes a tremendous amount of effort to follow all these things. And the second thing is, is be damn skeptical of all the things that are being claimed for these new technologies and how well they're going to work and how benign they're going to be and how, you know, they're going to help everybody out. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm highly skeptical because, you know, the 75 years of history of computing uh, has shown that that hasn't been, you know, the, the big worry. You know, the, the big, I wrote a paper about this on, on uh, the 75th anniversary of computing about computing ethics and how for the last 75 years, we've been worried about the technology, but what has been called the know-how, right? How things interconnect, how we get things to work. Not about the nowhere, which is what are we actually doing with these systems? What do we want them to do? How do we prevent them from hurting people? You know, we have systems that have been built, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a scandal right now in the UK uh, on the what's called Horizon Post Office scandal. Okay, this is the UK Post Office put in a, an accounting system back in 1999 in the post office to help postmasters, the all the local postmasters. Well, there was a flaw in the software. That flaw was known by the post office and known by the supplier, but they said instead that when there was outages, when there was shortfalls in, in postmaster accounts, that it was the postmasters who were fraudulently cheating the post office. So 750 plus postmasters over 14 years were criminally convicted for theft based on a software flaw that was known by post office and they refused to admit that there was a problem. It's now only come out in the last few years, and now the government is finally paying restitution to these people. But how do you tell somebody who has been thrown in prison that 
sorry, our fault, and we knew about it. Okay, that that's what I would call pure administrative evil. You know, systems being used to harm people on purpose. The same thing happened in Michigan with their unemployment system, where they went out and convicted and 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 said, you know, to the thirty four thousand people that you were you were. Uh, involved in unemployment fraud. They froze their accounts. They threw some in jail. Some people committed suicide. Now, what th these are things, when people say that this system works, it's great, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, we have 75 years of, of data that says, don't trust it. Yeah, there is a lot of utopianism out there. And Bob, I, that, to be perfectly frank, that's why I invited you to, to join us for this podcast, because I know that... Uh, I, I like you're yeah, the, you're the passionate about this. You're you're the black pill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're the you're the refreshing black pill to the over optimistic utopianism of this technology because nobody talks. You don't get very popular talking about the risks side of all these new technologies. And there's and it's and I, we've talked we talked about it, we've covered a lot of territory so far. We talked a little bit about IoT. We talked a little bit about autonomous vehicles, about the blockchain. Uh, what are your? Do you have any particular? thoughts about the the risks of machine learning or of deep learning in particular uh going forward lots of pie in the sky about that one thing that you know for that that you know i've learned you know in recent time is uh, to differentiate between these two is that you know with machine learning you've got um sort of mathematical or statistical models that are created that go run on top of the data that are probabilistic in nature and predictive in nature whereas with uh, deep learning, you've got neural networks, and that one of the interesting uh, side effects of, of, of these neural networks is that the experts don't really know what's going on inside those layers. They don't really have an understanding, which is the reason why uh, in, in when we hear, we hear about the stories of Google's DeepMind computer, when it famously beat the world champion of Go in 2016, that the experts had no idea how it had won. They had no way of grasping its strategy. It was almost superhuman because of the black box, the effective black box that is created by these neural networks. What, what are there any, do you think a lot about the, the risks of deep learning and going forward in particular, that lack of understanding and visibility? Yeah, that, that, that's an issue. It's not my field of expertise, to be honest, but it's, it's something that I'm, I'm concerned about. I'm more concerned about how humans interact with with systems like those okay it's it's been well documented that the bureaucracies organizations believe the output of their computers more than they should okay it's it, even when they're wrong even when they've been shown to be wrong okay the the horizon post office case the midas case centerlink in australia you know there's dozens of others you know there's there's you know you know uh maths of 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 mass destruction, right? Uh, weapons of mass. Is the my is the is the Midas case the unemployment case in Michigan? Yeah, that's in Michigan, and then Centerlink okay. is down in Australia, where they had something very similar that that went on to. What could you be specific? What happened in Australia? Well, there they again they they claim that people were were not entitled to benefits and that they were cheating on on their benefits, and it turned out that in fact you know the algorithms were you know poorly constructed had. Um, what, what they were supposed to do was look at um, periods, for instance, if, if you were on um, uh, unemployment for a short period of time, uh, it would average out for the whole year. So it'd say, well, you were obviously making um, too much money, okay? And that, that you owe us all this money because you, you were over a different time frame than, than what you really were, when in fact, <laughs> it was the algorithm that was wrong, not not the people uh, applying for benefit. And so again, it accused, you know, I think hundreds of thousands of people in Australia of of abuse, of financial welfare abuse, when it wasn't true at all. And again, these systems were put in place to save the government money, you know, the, to try to eliminate fraud. And in so doing, they caused, you know, uh, accused more people of fraud than ever before. So, but I think, you know, again, what I, if you take a look at uh, even a recent study last year in University of Georgia, I believe, that said people trust 
The outputs of algorithms more than they trust other people's judgments, especially in challenging situations. And so as we embed more and more AI and machine learn, whatever, whatever smart systems and, and approaches you're using, you know, how do you challenge those, right? Especially if the bias is to say you're wrong. Okay, it, it, that, that is the worry I have. Well, okay. I think there, there, there are, I think there are serious political uh, implications and social implications to that. If you have a society that doesn't that doesn't allow you to question, I mean, it's similar. The analog is, you know, we're all familiar with the the phrase, you know, listen to the science, or, or etc. Well, it's like listen to the AI. It's the same thing. If the AI is, you know, generally we can, uh, you know describe it as being a, a, a superior intelligence with superior analytical abilities and the ability to draw more correct con conclusions than the humans, then that's going to be, uh, that's going to become, uh, affect the, the world of, of uh, the, the wider world of the culture and, and the politics of our society, because people will be deferring uh, to, the, to the AI, whether the, and the AI can make mistakes, they will make mistakes. And, and, and you're and, right. That's and how, and again, how do you, how do you challenge that right now? You know, it's, it's hard enough, you know, if, the Social Security Administration thinks that you're dead, right? When you're not, it is it is hellish to show that you actually are alive, right? And that's today. That's without any AI. That's just you know, you you get you get you know the ultimate cancel culture is is being told that you're dead by you know your state to the and and tell the Social Security Administration that you're dead. You know th these these are things that this is the one. You know, if, if you wanted to have a, you know, I, I, I hate to say a government agency, but there, there needs to be some group that's responsible for investigating computing errors in government systems, especially because government systems really count more than, than private systems. OK, the government, you know, <laughs> government systems affect everything that you do. And so, and they have much more impact than, you know, if, if I don't like a reservation system on an airline, I can go to another airline, hopefully, you know, if there's one nearby. Um, but if, you know, the, the IRS or the state tax authority or the DMV or somebody else says that you've done something wrong when you haven't, it is really, really difficult to get that straightened out. And, you know, people, there we have cases you know, continually of, of people being thrown in prison for too long or incorrectly because of a computer error, okay? And, and basically it takes a lot, you have to hire a lawyer, you have to, you know, go through all this expense. And then the government says, well, uh, you know, sorry, but all that cost is yours. Like going back to the Midas case, it's still up at the Supreme Court in, in Michigan to see whether or not those people who lost their homes, who had their, their um, were, were penalized, had wages garnished, you know, will actually be able to get full recompense, you know, because the government, the state government of Michigan is fighting as hard as they can and saying, well, we're not responsible for errors we make, okay? Now, if, if we have computer systems that are even more integrated, that cause greater harm and especially if they're government computing systems, you know, this is totally, in my mind, it's totally unacceptable. We need a, a, a national as well as statewide uh, ability, capability to go to people to look and say, you know what? Yeah, you guys screwed up. And also too, because you screwed up, um, you got to pay them, you know, for their, for their trouble. You know, it's, this, this is going to get worse before it gets better. And right now, I don't see, uh, you know, there's no one in Congress, no one in the House, there's no one in, in the planet that I know of, right, who, has, and no government, you know, in the world has set up any organization to say, yeah, tell us when we screw up, and we'll try to go fix it, right? It's up to the individual to fix government errors. It's bad enough for corporations, you know, when they send, you know, false information to credit bureaus and, you know, they harass you. That's that's almost as bad as, as being told you're dead by the by, you know, the IRS or the or the Social Security Administration, you know, as you get corrupted data into a into a debt collector's database. You know, at least there's some laws that allow you to go and try to go to fix that. But um, 
for government systems, nah, you know, you're on your own. Uh, yes, this remind, all of this is essentially the plot of Terry Gilliam's Brazil. I just didn't think that that was <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that that was going to be a, a, a movie that was predictive. I was when I saw it uh, growing up, I, I, I thought it was science fiction. Unfortunately, it sounds like it's become true in a lot of ways. But, you know, again, that's why I had you on 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 the podcast, Bob, because you're you're the you're 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 a straight shooter. You tell it like it is. But. But the, the 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 subject for for today's talk was is managing IT risk for both fun and profit. So maybe we could shift gears and you could talk a little bit, uh, put on your utopian hat, and talk a little bit about uh, your your view of um, of how computing and can be used as a fantastic tool to benefit humanity, as opposed to something that is inherently dangerous uh, because of these risks. Maybe you would, you'd like to just shift gears and just cheer our audience up a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I think part of the thing is 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 to understand the, the the power of computing because the power of computing is paradoxical. It can it can be used for for fantastic benefits as well as for you know pretty I hate to say the word evil, but things that are not particularly pleasant. And so let's we need to go back a little bit, you know, to to think about you know what what really why are we in the state we we're in? And part of it is that computing more than any other technology has transformed how we've managed risk. Okay, uh, Peter Bernstein wrote in, in his book, you know, Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk, that the boundary between modern society and the past was the mastery of risk, right? We didn't, we didn't blame the gods for our problems, right? We understood that, you know, with what we did, the actions we took, the decisions that we made, that made that difference. So we could start to understand that we were more in control than just being, you know, letting fate, you know, take over. And, and we were, you know, bound by whatever, you know, the gods decided for us. So, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting to me was that, uh, and I think John Bernstein, who I don't think is related to, uh, to Peter Bernstein, uh, he's, he's a historian, you know, wrote in his book, you know, Progress in the Quest for Meaning, that what, after all, is technology other than the management of risk? Okay, technology, if we think about technology, let's go back to the earliest forms of technology, like the stone axe, right? Uh, there's a great book by James Burke, which calls the, the Axe Maker's Gift, which talks about how the axe, right? Well, if you think about an axe, what is, it, what, what, what is so important about the axe? Well, the axe not only gave you this capability to cut things, right, and to be able to shape things, but that it captured knowledge, it captured decisions, right? When you make an axe and you have to make a blade, you have to, you know, use a flint and you, you create that axe, right? What you've done is you've consciously created a human artifact. And one of the interesting things is if you think about it, everything that, that is a human artifact is a set of decisions, right? The, the time wearing, somebody had to make make the colors, somebody had to do something like this, right? Somebody had to, to, to look at the weave, all these things, everything that, that you see, everything that's in your that's in your apartment or your house, Michael, you know, is, is a result of, of decisions. You know, I have a my my cup, my bird cup here with, with water. You know, how many decisions were made to make this size cup? How do I make the process? All those things are, are a result of decisions, right? That we've captured. And we capture that information in other artifacts, right? We we capture it. It, it, it was really, it's really interesting. We've captured it in tools, we've captured it in, in other elements, but now we, once written language came and we had books and we had printing press, now we've captured it and we were able to pass that knowledge on so we can continue to build on that, right? So if we think about it, all human artifacts are really, you know, instantiations of a set of decisions. And those are millions and billions of decisions over time, you know, that, that has created modern society. So, What's interesting now, and this is something that, that Herb Simon, who was a Nobel Prize winning e economist and ACM Turing Award winner, you know, he, he said that you know, energy and information are the two basic currencies of organic and societal systems. A new technology alters the term of which one or the other of these is available to a system, can work on it, it makes the most profound changes. Okay, so information, right, and, and energy. So now, what we have is you take a look at what at mechanic at, at the industrial revolution, that was with mechanical and mechanical energies, and then with, with electricity, 
right, as we move through. But now with, with automation, you know, we've been able to automate functions that used to be just in our minds, right? We, we've been able to create things in compute, with computing that were only ideas. What's, what's even more interesting is, is the philosopher James Moore back in, I think it was 1984, said that computing is the nearest thing to the universal tool. And the reason is, is that because a computer is really a giant decision-making machine, right? It, it, it's all about making decisions, lots of them very fast, is that we're able to, in, in essence, you know, manage the three root causes of, of risk, the lack of information, the lack of control, and the lack of time in ways that we've never been able to do before. So we're able to really um, not only make artifacts in, in ways that are, that are staggering, but think the other thing that's, that people forget about computing, and this is probably one of the most important things, is that how many decisions do we not have to make because of computing? And what I mean by that is that my grandfather was a master tool maker. Okay, he, he created tools to make tools. All right. So when you when you do that, you have to make prototypes. You have to physically make a prototype, right? And you have to test it out and you have to see if it works. And then you will make a machine. If it does work, you then make a machine to make that tool that can be used in other things. So again, you codify look at all the information that you're you're codifying in that. Now, one of the interesting things is, is that before computing, for the most part, all you know, you had to build prototypes, right? You had to build dies, you had to test things out, you had to put them in analog, you had to, you know, physically manipulate them. Well, with computing, you don't have to do that anymore, right? You don't have to design things physically to see whether or not they fit. You can use a computer to decide that, yeah, that pipe ain't going to go quite like that. It needs to, it needs to be moved. So all these things, one of the, one of the, the, the levels of productivity that's not measured today, when, when people talked about, you know, computing, the productivity did not you know, was not increased by, by computing, is that I, I thought they measured the wrong thing. They didn't measure all the things that weren't done anymore because of computing, right? It's like the difference between, you know, if I measure productivity in terms of, of, of manpower, yeah, I dig a ditch with 50 people or I have a steam shovel with one person. If I measure manpower, I got only one person in the steam shovel, right? I didn't look at all the stuff that, that I've gotten rid of, all those other things. It's the same thing here. Computing has allowed us to not do things that we used to do, all right? And that's one of the dangers, right? One of the things we talked about earlier was what happens when computing gets to automate everything, <laughs> right? Automates everybody's jobs, right? What happens then? You know, that, that becomes another, you know, that's kind of the downside of being able to, you know, get rid of things, right? But at the same time, because we're able to get rid of things, and we're able to do things that we couldn't do before, then you know, one of the benefits of computing is, is for instance, pollution. You know, cars, you know, internal combustion engine cars, when I was a kid, you know, you know, having having great big blue plumes of smoke, you know, out of your 1956 Oldsmobile that you had, you know, wasn't you know thought of as particularly bad, right? Well, today, right, in the first minute of a car you know, that pollution is controlled because of all the computing, the algorithms that control airflow, timing, you know, spark plugs, all that stuff to reduce pollution to, to virtually nothing in comparison to a 1956 Oldsmobile, right? So, so we've had tremendous benefits. Every industry has seen change that, that, that we haven't been able to do before because of computing. But as I said, the, the other aspect of that is that it also allows you know, bad things to happen. And part of that is the essence of computing, which is another element. You know, Fred Brooks wrote this, this great paper right back, oh, had to be in the, in, in the 1980s. I can't remember the exact date. It may have even been before that, but I think it was the 1980s, you know, called you know, the no silver bullet, you know, the, the essence in accidents and software engineering, which I think every computing person, anybody who's involved in computing should read uh, extremely closely because it's still true today. He talked about four things in particular that made computing unique. And, and also when the paper was about why it's so hard to, to create software systems. 
And the first one was complexity. You know, there's a lot of complexity in a software, in a, in a computing system, right? In the number of lines of code. Think about a modern vehicle today has 100 plus, you know, uh, microcomputers and anywhere from 100 to, to 300 million lines of code, All right? That's a lot of complexity to have a car. And just in the engine alone, there's tens of millions of lines of code in modern engines to keep the pollution controls in, in, in place. So, you know, the complexity of, of computing is, and, and software is one of those, those things that really makes it, it hard um, to do, but also that complexity also makes it hard to understand when we go back, when we're talking about that, those AI systems. We also talk about conformity, you know, software and, and you know, itself doesn't, there's no physical laws, there's no software physical law, right, you know, in, in terms of physics, but, you know, software has to conform to specifications, right, you, you can't just write code, you have, you know, you have languages, you have definitions, you have interfaces, you have, you know, hardware that it has to run on. There's all these different levels of abstraction that, that need to interoperate together and they have to be very specific for something to, to operate correctly. And, you know, one or two errors in the, in the wrong place and the whole system can, come, can collapse. You know, this, is, this has happened many times in the past in, in major systems where a single line of code or two lines of code are, are bad and, and a massive system goes out. So, you know, that, that's one thing. So you have to be, you don't have any laws of physics that you follow, but at the same time, you have to follow, you know, conformity, these specifications at multiple levels of abstraction. The other aspect of, of software is, is how changeable it is, right? That's one of the incredibly powerful things about software is that we can change it, right? If something is wrong, it and, and if you can find out where it is wrong, <laughs> you can go back and change it. Or if you want to modify it to improve it, you know, you, it, it isn't, you know, intensive, a single individual can make tremendous changes in a software program, right? We're not talking about, you know, I don't know how many people it took to, to build the transcontinental railroad, but we're not talking about, you know, masses and masses of people, tens of thousands of people putting out one, one program, right? We're, we, we're talking about small teams can create something incredibly impressive. The other aspect of, of computing that and, and software that Brooks talked about was its invisibility, which is that you know we can't see it, right? We're we're talking, you know, over the, over this system, right? In this this online system that we're using with Zoom, and there's a tremendous amount of software that's that's operating in, in the background. We don't see it. I don't see it, right? But we know it's there. We know it's it's happening. It's in our browser. It's it's in our systems. It's in our cameras. It's it's everywhere. All the applications that are running, which are what probably dozens, if not hundreds, actually to make all this thing work. And, and we don't have any idea of what, what it does, right? So it, it's invisible. And in, even, you know, if you ask somebody even at Zoom to say, can you track all the software assets that are being used, all the applications in Zoom at any one particular point in time, when two people like you and I are talking, I doubt they could tell you, right? It, it's invisible even to them, right? So no one really has a, has a, has a firm view of, of, it's the proverbial, 12 linemen and, and, and an elephant. It's up the elephant's about 5 million miles wide and, and 5 million miles high. Um, so with that invisibility, you know, and that complexity and that conformance and that changeability also creates not only all the benefits that software has and also makes it hard, but also makes it dangerous because we don't know what's going on. We don't know how it's changed. We can't see everything. You know, there's, there's been many, many occasions where that invisibility has, has hurt people. You know, for, for a long time, and in certain countries it's still true, you know, banks would go and take a look and stack your, you know, deposits and withdrawals in your bank account in a way to maximize the probability that you would be overdrawn so they could hit you with a fee. OK, some states have outlawed that. I'm not sure it's outlawed in every state. But, you know, that's something that you didn't know that they were doing. Right. And and it's, it also shows how it's easy to abuse, you know, the system. Anyway, I've well, we want to be positive. We wanna be, <laughs> no, we, we want to be positive now. This is your this is your chance yeah. to be positive. We're slipping back into the dystopian. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I think I, something I think, again, the, the benefits oh, look, the benefits. We, we look. We, we couldn't do. We couldn't have this conversation without right. software, 
right? We, we couldn't, you know, have instant communications without software. We couldn't have modern society, you know, wouldn't exist without software. And, and you know, I, yeah, there's there were certain, you know, maybe great days of living when I was a kid in the, in the early 1960s. But believe me, I wouldn't want to go back there, right? The, the, I, I like I like my personal computer. I like having going on the web. I like being able to surf the web. I like being able to, you know, talk to my kids on the phone or text them whenever I want. I'd like, you know, the, the, the fact that I have a car that, that, you know, doesn't pollute. I, I like the fact that, you know, we can, you know, start moving off fossil fuels more than, than we, we've had, we've been able to in the past. You know, I like the fact that, you know, I can order a pizza online and get it, you know, within three minutes of me, you know, getting there, you know, it's, I'd like all those, all those benefits, right. In terms of, you know, visibility and the things that I, I didn't have before, you know, just in terms of research, you know, me, I, you know, I have a, a library here with, without exaggeration that has, you know, probably in the neighborhood of about eight to 10,000 books in, in my home. And, and yet, you know, that, that isn't necessary. You know, when I first started in the business, it was necessary. Right to to collect because my my work is to understand all these interconnections of technology and society and politics and everything else. So I have a big shelves full of of risk books and economics and history and you know politics. It, you know you name it, I have it in my library. But you know it's all online, most of it. Uh, although I do there there is one benefit is that there I have a lot of things that are no longer online. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the one thing I think historians are probably going to be really irritated about is, is that a, a lot of things that are only online are disappearing and that, that, you know, there will be big for, for a society that has published more information almost every day than has ever occurred in the previous, you know, 2000 years, uh, how much of it is, is going to be missing, you know, 10, 20 years from now. And, and and maybe forever, because things are are you know impermanent. But again, I I, I think you know technology is great. Uh, I, but I'm also as I said, I'm a cynical optimist, right? There's this is all great, but it could be greater, right? That's the thing. You know, we don't need to have 2.8 trillion dollars of poor software. We don't need to have project failures. We don't need to be you know persecuting people over fraud that they didn't commit because of computer systems, right? We know how to do things better, but what really gets me irritated is that we don't do things better because, you know, for, for whatever reasons, politics, laziness, you know, stubbornness, arrogance, things that, you know, may be part of the human condition, but again, it, it doesn't say that, that we should accept them either. I want to end this, uh, this discussion on a positive note. So, is there I've been positive. anything? I've been positive. No, no, I've no, no positive. I know you've been positive. I know you've been positive. I said I want to. I want to make sure that we end it on a positive note. And so I'm wondering if you could, you know, to close, if you could uh, give us any uh, advice about, or give give the your 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 audience uh, any advice about how to how we can sort of maximize the positive, minimize the negative in terms of better managing these risks as we go into this era of digital transformation. Uh, how to be more cognizant of it, and how we can sort of hope, hopefully optimize the risk, the, the this equation, so that we get more good outcomes and less bad outcomes uh, as we as we move into the next five to ten years. I okay, I have a a, a couple of max, and you know me, I have, I have a whole yeah, bunch. I know that's why I asked the question well, because a lot of there's, there's a long there's a long yeah, there's list, a long of list but I, I won't, I won't, I won't I'll, 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 we'll be here for another three hours. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I think you know one of the things. The first off is is to master the detail, to master the risk, right? You, we really need to master what it is that we want these computing systems to do. We need to think about not only all the benefits, but we need to think about the downsides and then to balance those risks and rewards and make sure that we're very transparent about it, right? If we, if we don't ask about the risk, we're not gonna ever hear about them. And so, you know, we only profit, you know, profit comes from managing risk. Right, all, all exchanges of goods and services and exchange of risk and opportunity between the people. We've had this discussion many times before and, and people you know, don't quite understand it. All right, if, if, I'm, if I have a water leak, if one of my pipes is leaking in my house, I call a plumber, right? 
Now, I don't have to. I could buy all the plumbing tools. I could go to plumbing school, you know, apprentice, so I could fix my leak. Well, it's a lot easier to call a plumber. Now, that plumber has taken the risk, right, of, of doing all that with the hope that somebody has a leak that they're going to be called to go fix it. So to him, to that plumber or her, they look at, at me as an opportunity, all right? I look at them as my problem solver, my risk solver, because they're going to come here and, and do that. So, you know, risk, risk, where profit comes from, and this is, you know, again, a, a basis of economics, you don't have profit without risk, right? You sell things to people because you manage their risk. That's why they buy from you. You're, if you're the best risk manager of your customer, you're going to be king of the king of the hill. That's, that is just, there's, there's no doubt about it. We can call them problems, which are just risks that have occurred, but you're still, that's, that's where profit comes from. So the more we're able to manage the risk, more we under, understand risk, the richer we're going to get, by the way. Okay. That's, that is just a, a given, which for whatever reason, people don't seem to understand. They, they, you know, what, what bothers me, I'm going to be negative for one sec, is, is that in government, people say they're, they're risk averse because they don't want to identify the risk. They don't want to tell people about the risk. Well, my, my way of thinking, they're incredibly risk-taking <laughs> because what they're doing is they're almost guaranteeing that, that they're going to have failures. Where, you know, if, if you really want to get ahead of the game, you look at risks very coldly. You know, Tim Lister, you know, used to say that risk management was for adults. And that's what it is. You look at it, you know, with, with what my math, old math professor in high school would say, a jaundiced die. You would you'd really carefully look at it and figure out how you're going to solve that so you can move on. And, and computing as a, as a whole, the industry as a whole has taken that, right? We, we continue to, to manage risk. We bring out new things that hopefully manage risk. The downside is, is that we've also created other risks and doing that, right? Which we, which we need to be a little bit more open about. You know, it, it's, let's understand both sides of the equation. The other thing is, is that assumptions made are risks taken, right? As I said before, assumptions really underpin most failures. You know, the failure to really understand them or even reflect on them. And so we need to do that better. The other, an, another one is, is that if you can't reverse a decision, you can't manage risk, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what? I have more information. I need to revisit this before I move on. You know, it, 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 we, we, could, we could devolve into politics, which I don't want to do. But, you know, this, and there's this idea that, you know, it, it comes from, I forget who said it, but I saw it in a John Wayne movie. You know, never apologize. It's a, it's a sign of weakness. And part of that apology aspect is that you can't reverse a decision, right? Well, yeah, you can't. Right? That's the only way you get ahead. And if you don't reverse your decision, guess what? You're not going to earn any profit. You're going to earn a hell of a lot of loss. The, the last one I'm going to leave people with really is that risk management isn't about future decisions. It's about the future of present decisions, right? It's what we do now, right? It's we can change the world if we work on the decisions that we're making now. Right. There's been a lot of bad things that have happened. You know, let's learn from those and let's let's look and say, how do we move forward? Right. And if, if there's one fault of the IT industry and it's not just the IT industry, but the IT industry in particular has this is that we fail to learn from from our experience. Right. We we, we need to learn from experience. I don't understand it, it. To be honest, you know, I've been in this business for for, you know, almost five decades now. And I see the same mistakes over and over and over again. And I, I am flabbergasted that we don't have, a, we, we, we continue to make those same mistakes. Okay. It, it's really needless. It's costly. It's, you know, frankly, stupid. And, um, you know, it made me a lot of money over a long time, <laughs> but, you know, it, it really is gets to be a little disheartening when you go in and you say, yeah, I've seen this, you know, this before, right? There's nothing new here. Um, so anyway, you know, manage your risk ecology, make a lot of money, because if you can manage that ecology, especially as computing now becomes more complicated, there's a lot more opportunity to actually make sure that 
those risks are managed. And if you can, you know, look at those edge cases, look at where the interfaces are, because that's where the risks are. That, that you know, the next billionaires will all, I'll, I'll guarantee you, the next billionaires will be the ones who manage all these, these interfaces and manage those risks. Solid, solid advice. Managing IT risk for fun and profit. Dr. Robert Charette, always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, our, for those of you who uh, want to uh, read more about Dr. Charette, uh, you can Google him, Robert N. Charette. You can go to IEEE Spectrum. He's got a lot of articles out there. Uh, they're excellent. I always learn something about the world that I'm living in when I read one of Dr. Charette's articles. Bob, so great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for all of your time. Hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you, Michael. And uh, it's been a pleasure.